Hey folks, in this video we're going to explore duality in linear algebra. I assume that you've already seen some linear algebra before. In particular, I assume that you're familiar with the basics of finite dimensional vector spaces and inner product spaces. Maybe you've even seen dual spaces before. If you've seen them but didn't really understand what all the fuss was about, this video is for you. To begin, consider the matrix seen here. The row rank is the dimension of the subspace of R4 spanned by the row vectors 2, 5, 2, 8, and so on. The column rank is the dimension of the subspace of R3 spanned by the column vectors 2, 6, 7, and so on. For this matrix, the row rank and column rank both equal 3. The fact that the row rank equals the column rank is not coincidental, however. In fact, we have a theorem. For any m by n matrix, the row rank equals the column rank. This result is surprising and mysterious. It tells us, for example, that if a matrix with 1 million rows and 2 million columns happens to have a row rank of 737,123, then it also has a column rank of 737,123. Why in God's name would that be true? One important way to understand the result is through duality. We'll start by looking at a simple example of duality. Consider three-dimensional Euclidean space R3. The inner product, or dot product, of two vectors x and y is denoted by parentheses. The orthogonal complement of a set S of vectors is the subspace S complement, consisting of the vectors x such that x times y is equal to zero for all vectors y and s. We can visualize this easily. Here, for example, the orange line is the orthogonal complement of the blue plane, and vice versa. It's useful to keep this picture in mind. There are a number of basic facts about orthogonal complements in R3, which you've probably seen before. Take a moment to pause the video and think through these. Here the sum u plus w is the smallest subspace containing both u and w. The intersection u intersect w is the largest subspace contained in both u and w. A fundamental fact is that the dimension of a subspace u plus the dimension of the subspace u complement is equal to the dimension of v, which in this case is 3. For example, if u is a one-dimensional line, then u complement is a two-dimensional plane, as we saw in the picture, and certainly 1 plus 2 equals 3. If we define the codimension of a subspace w to be the dimension of v minus the dimension of w, this just says that the dimension of u is the codimension of u complement, and the dimension of u complement is the codimension of u. Now consider a familiar dimension inequality, which says that the dimension of the sum of two subspaces is at most the sum of their dimensions. For example, if u and w are lines, then their sum is contained in a plane. It's possible to compute the dimension of the sum exactly, but we don't need to for this simple example. We can immediately obtain from this inequality a corresponding codimension inequality, which says that the codimension of an intersection of two subspaces is at most the sum of their codimensions. For example, if u and w are planes, then their intersection contains a line. To prove this, first observe from the basic facts earlier that u intersect w is u complement complement intersect w complement complement, which is just the complement of the sum u complement plus w complement. It follows that the codimension of u intersect w is the dimension of u complement plus w complement, which by the dimension inequality is at most the dimension of u complement plus the dimension of w complement, which is just the codimension of u plus the codimension of w. The dimension inequality can also be proved from the codimension inequality by similar reasoning, as you should verify. These inequalities exhibit duality. Each is obtained from the other by making certain syntactic substitutions, in this case swapping dimension and codimension, and sum and intersection. Each is proved from the other by taking orthogonal complements under the inner product. In a certain sense, the inequalities are like mirror images of one another. We essentially get two inequalities for the price of one. And who doesn't like saving a few shekels on inequalities? But the inner product in R3 is just a special case of duality. Recall that it is bilinear, which means it is linear in each argument separately, as seen here. 
It is also non-degenerate, which means that if x times y is equal to 0 for all y, then x is equal to 0. And similarly, if y times x is equal to 0 for all x, then y is equal to 0. We can use these two properties to define duality more generally. Two vector spaces v and v star over a field gamma are said to be dual if there exists a non-degenerate bilinear form, here denoted by angle brackets, defined between them. The bilinear form is called the scalar product. The scalar product of a vector x star in v star and a vector x in v is denoted by x star times x. Here there is no relationship between x star and x. x star is an arbitrary vector in v star, and x is an arbitrary vector in v. Note that this definition is fundamentally symmetric between v and v star. Although v star appears on the left-hand side in the scalar product, we could just as soon use the transposed scalar product where v star appears on the right-hand side. We will exploit this symmetry extensively. If you've already seen duality somewhere else before, note in particular that v star is not assumed to be the space of linear forms on v. I'll say more about that later. Let's now look at some examples of dual spaces. First, if v is a real inner product space, then v is dual to itself under the inner product, as we've already seen in the case of R3. The question naturally arises, what about complex inner product spaces? Recall that a complex inner product is conjugate linear in one argument, as seen here. So technically, it is not a scalar product. However, we can work around this issue. If v is a complex vector space, the conjugate space v conjugate has the same underlying real vector space as v, but with scalar multiplication defined using complex conjugation. Here the left-hand side is scalar multiplication in v conjugate, while the right-hand side is scalar multiplication in v. The identity map kappa from v to v conjugate is then conjugate linear, because kappa of alpha x plus beta y is alpha conjugate kappa x plus beta conjugate kappa y, as you should verify. Now, if v is a complex inner product space, then v is dual to v conjugate under the scalar product defined here. Notice how the conjugate linearity of kappa counteracts the conjugate linearity of the inner product to produce a scalar product. In this case, two wrongs really do make a right. As another important example, if LV is the space of linear forms on V, that is, the space of linear maps from V into the base field gamma, then V is dual to LV under the scalar product where F times X is just F of X. It's worth pausing the video to think through why this really is a non-degenerate bilinear form. In a certain sense, linear forms are a universal example. If V and V star are dual spaces, there is a natural injective linear map from V star to LV given by sending a vector X star to the linear form X star times blank. This linear form takes in a vector X in V and returns the scalar product X star times X. If V is finite dimensional, the map is an isomorphism. To see why this is true, First observe that the map from v star to lv is linear by bilinearity of the scalar product, and injective by non-degeneracy of the scalar product. If v is finite dimensional, then we know that the dimension of lv is equal to the dimension of v. So by injectivity of the map, the dimension of v star is at most the dimension of v. In particular, v star is also finite dimensional. By symmetry of duality, it follows that the dimension of v is at most the dimension of v star, so the dimension of v is equal to the dimension of v star, and the map is surjective. Of course, there is also a map from v to lv star given by sending a vector x to the linear form blank times x. But it's important to see that this theorem does not give us a natural map from v to lv. In general, v is not naturally isomorphic to lv, even when v is finite dimensional. We will see a special case where this is true in just a moment, however. It follows from the theorem that if v is finite dimensional, and v star 1 and v star 2 are both dual to v, there is a natural isomorphism from v star 1 to v star 2 which preserves the scalar product. This means that a finite dimensional dual space is unique up to unique isomorphism. In particular, if v is finite dimensional, then since v is dual to lv, and lv is dual to llv, it follows that there is a natural isomorphism from v to llv, 
given by sending a vector x to the linear form which evaluates linear forms at x. This is called reflexivity, and means that a vector x can be naturally identified with the linear form evaluation at x. Now, why would we ever want to do this? Well, it can be useful to view a vector as a linear form. In fact, in many treatments of duality which do not use our definition of dual space, LV is the singular dual space of V, and LLV is the double dual or bi dual space of V. If V is finite dimensional, then V is identified with LLV by reflexivity to establish symmetry of the duality relation between V and LV. By contrast, we obtain symmetry by definition. Ours is certainly the better approach here, and anyone who thinks otherwise is a crazy person. In the case of a finite dimensional real inner product space, we do obtain from the theorem a natural isomorphism from V to LV, given by sending a vector x to the linear form x times blank under the inner product. This means a vector x can be naturally associated with the linear form multiplication by x. This linear form is called the covector of x, and is very useful in many applications. A similar result holds in the complex case. Moving on. If V and V star are dual spaces and U is a subspace of V, we can define its orthogonal complement in the obvious way. Note U complement is a subspace of V star. By symmetry, we can also take complements of subspaces of V star to obtain subspaces of V. We have a number of basic facts, similar to the ones we saw earlier in the special case of R3, although not everything carries over to the infinite dimensional case. For every fact here, there is a corresponding fact for subspaces of V star, again by symmetry. This leads to another important example. A scalar product is induced between the subspace U and the quotient space V star mod U complement by the rule seen here, where the bar denotes projection. So U is dual to V star mod U complement. It's worth pausing the video to verify that this really is a well-defined non-degenerate bilinear form. This means that subspaces are dual to quotient spaces. Every fact about subspaces can be translated into a corresponding fact about quotient spaces and vice versa. This is extremely useful because it may be easier to see that a certain fact is true of quotient spaces, say, and then translate that to a fact about subspaces rather than prove the fact about subspaces directly. We saw something similar with the codimension inequality for intersections in R3 earlier. If V is finite dimensional, it follows from this example that the dimension of U plus the dimension of U complement is equal to the dimension of V, which remains a fundamental fact. Bases are extremely important for computation. If V and V star are finite dimensional dual spaces, then bases x1 to xn of V and x star 1 to x star n of V star are dual if x star j times xi is equal to delta ij, which is 1 when i equals j and 0 otherwise. That delta is called the Kronecker delta. Note this definition is symmetric between the two bases. It's immediate from non-degeneracy of the scalar product that the dual basis is unique if it exists. As an example, if x1 to xn is a basis of v, then the linear forms f1 to fn defined by fj of xi equals delta ij constitute a dual basis of LV, as you should verify. It follows from this example and the theorem on linear forms that a dual basis always exists. And by symmetry, every basis is a dual basis. But remember, we're only talking about the finite dimensional case here. These facts don't carry over to the infinite dimensional case. If x1 to xn and x star 1 to x star n are dual bases, and x is the sum over i of alpha i xi, then x star j times x is just alpha j. This means a vector's components with respect to a basis are just its scalar products with the dual basis vectors. As an example, if V is a finite dimensional real inner product space with basis x1 to xn and dual basis x star 1 to x star n in LV, then for a vector x, the covector x star, equal to the sum over i of alpha star i x star i, satisfies alpha star i equals the scalar product of x star and xi, which is just the inner product of x and xi. In other words, a covector's components with respect to a dual basis are just the vector's inner products with the basis vectors. Duality gets more interesting with arrows, that is, linear maps. 
If V V star and W W star are pairs of dual spaces, then linear maps phi from V to W and phi star to V star from W star are dual if they satisfy this relation. Phi star Y star times X equals Y star times phi X for all Y star in W star and X in V. I'll say more about this relation in a second, but first notice the arrow is reversed between phi and phi star, like a mirror image. Also, like the definition of dual space, this definition is fundamentally symmetric between phi and phi star. The relation in the definition is equivalent to commutativity of this diagram, which helps to visualize the situation and also to see how one might arrive at the relation by thinking about the possible interactions of linear maps and scalar products. It's immediate from non-degeneracy of the scalar product that a dual map is unique if it exists. As an example, if phi is a linear map from V to W, then the dual map phi star 2LV from LW is given by precomposition of phi. This can be visualized in this diagram. It follows from this example and the theorem on linear forms that a dual map always exists in the finite dimensional case. As another example, if V and W are finite dimensional real inner product spaces and phi is a linear map from V to W, then the dual map phi star 2V from W satisfies phi star Y times X equals Y times phi X under the inner products for all Y and W and X and V. Therefore, phi star is just the familiar adjoint of phi. In this context, it's useful to think intuitively of linear transformations on V like complex numbers, which act on the complex plane through multiplication. Under this analogy, an adjoint is like a complex conjugate, the reflection of a complex number through the real line. This analogy is strong and leads to important parallels between classes of linear transformations and classes of complex numbers, as seen in this beautiful table. What about complex inner product spaces? If V and W are finite dimensional complex inner product spaces and phi is a linear map from V to W, then there is a dual map phi star 2V conjugate from W conjugate. The adjoint is just the conjugate of the dual by the conjugate linear identity maps, as seen in this commutative diagram. So in the complex case, the adjoint is almost the dual, like the inner product is almost the scalar product. Now let V and W be vector spaces with subspaces V1 and W1. If phi is a linear map from V to W which maps V1 into W1, there are induced subspace and quotient maps, phi1 from V1 to W1, and phi bar from V mod V1 to W mod W1, making this diagram commute. Here phi1 x equals phi x for all x in V1, and phi bar x bar equals phi x bar for all x in V where the bars denote projection. This leads to another important example. If phi is dual to phi star, then phi 1 from v1 to w1 is dual to phi star bar, 2 v star mod v1 complement from w star mod w1 complement. This extends our previous example which showed that subspaces are dual to quotient spaces by showing that subspace maps are dual to quotient maps. In particular, the canonical injection from V1 into V is dual to the canonical projection onto V star mod V1 complement from V star. The star operation has several basic properties. If phi phi star and psi psi star are dual maps between dual spaces V V star and W W star, then alpha phi plus beta psi has the dual alpha phi star plus beta psi star. If omega omega star are also dual maps between the dual spaces w w star and x x star, then omega after phi has the dual phi star after omega star. Note the order reversal here. Finally, if iota is an identity map, then so is iota star. Now let l phi 2 l v from l w denote the dual map of phi given by precomposition. Then these results show that l is linear and l reverses composites. Since L also preserves identity maps, it follows that L is a contravariant functor in the category of vector spaces. To learn more about functors, see my other videos about category theory. The kernels and images of dual maps are fundamental. If phi and phi star are dual, then it's easy to see that the kernel of phi is the complement of the image of phi star, 
and, by symmetry, the kernel of phi star is the complement of the image of phi. In the finite dimensional case, we can take complements of both sides of these equations to obtain that the image of phi is the complement of the kernel of phi star, and the image of phi star is the complement of the kernel of phi. These equations have many important applications, but we will look at just a few. First, if phi maps from v to w and the dual map phi star maps to v star from w star, then the induced isomorphisms from v mod the kernel of phi to the image of phi and to the image of phi star from w star mod the kernel of phi star are dual. Second, if v is finite dimensional, it follows that the dimension of the image of phi star is just the codimension of the kernel of phi, which is just the dimension of the image of phi by the rank nullity theorem. Therefore, the rank of phi star equals the rank of phi. Let v and v star be finite dimensional dual spaces. If phi and phi star are dual transformations on v and v star, they have much in common, including rank, as we just saw, nullity, determinant, trace, minimal polynomial, characteristic polynomial, eigenvalues, and more. It becomes clearer that they really are like mirror images of one another. They also share a common bilinear form. We obtain as another corollary of the theorem on linear forms that if v and v star are finite dimensional dual spaces and phi is a bilinear form between them, then there are unique dual linear transformations phi on v and phi star on v star which represent the bilinear form through the scalar product. This correspondence induces natural isomorphisms between the space of bilinear forms and the spaces of linear transformations on v star and v. It's worth noting that despite the strong resemblance, no one calls the triple phi 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 star a holy trinity. Nevertheless, after watching this video, I hope you have the witness of the dual transformation in your heart. If V is a finite dimensional real inner product space, this correspondence is between bilinear forms on V and linear transformations of V under the inner product. Properties of the bilinear form correspond to those of the transformations, like symmetry, skew symmetry, and so on, with some mild assumptions on the ground field. This is one reason why the study of bilinear forms and associated quadratic forms is so central in linear algebra. In this context, there is also a natural isomorphism from the space of bilinear forms on V to the space of linear transformations from V into the space of linear forms on V, given by currying the bilinear forms. This allows us to write phi of x, y as phi of x of y. Now, if the bilinear form phi corresponds to the linear transformation phi, then the pair is connected by the Riesz representation, as seen here. If we instead curry y first instead of x, then we obtain a similar connection involving phi adjoint instead of phi. We return now to computation. Specifically, what happens when we change bases? Let xi, x star i, and yi, y star i be two pairs of dual bases in v, v star. If tau is a linear transformation of v, then we know tau star y star j times xi equals y star j times tau xi. It follows immediately that tau maps from the x's to the y's, if and only if tau star maps to the x stars from the y stars. This means that change of basis in a space is contragradient to change of dual basis in a dual space. As an example, let v be a finite dimensional real inner product space. If basis vectors are changed according to tau, then we know that vector components are changed according to tau inverse. Due to contragradients, co-vector components are changed according to tau, as we can see here. For this reason, the co-vector components are called covariant components, while the vector components are called contravariant components. This covariance is one of the properties that makes covectors useful in applications. Finally, we turn our attention back to matrices. Let xi, x star i be dual bases in v, v star, and let yi, y star i be dual bases in w, w star. Then we have a theorem. If phi from v to w and phi star to v star from w star are dual maps, then the matrix of phi star with respect to the y stars and the x stars is the transpose of the matrix of phi with respect to the x's and the y's. More succinctly, the matrix of a map with respect to bases is the transpose of the matrix of the dual map with respect to the dual bases.
The proof is straightforward. Let the matrix of phi star be alpha star ij, and the matrix of phi be alpha ij, where for both the alpha stars and the alphas, the first index counts rows, and the second index counts columns. Then by definition, we have these expressions for phi star and phi. It follows that alpha star ij is equal to alpha ji, so the matrices are transposed. It's worth noting that sometimes in linear algebra, for example when working with tensors or with modules over possibly non-commutative rings, it's common to adopt a transpose convention for matrices in dual spaces. If this is done, the theorem then states that dual maps have the same matrix. However, in either case, transposition is happening somewhere. With this result in hand, we can now prove the theorem on matrix rank from earlier. If M is a matrix, then M induces a linear map through left multiplication of column vectors. It's easy to see that the column rank of M is the rank of this map. The row rank of M is the column rank of M transpose, which induces the dual map by the previous result. But the ranks of the dual maps are equal, as we know. Therefore, the row rank of M equals the column rank of M, and the proof is complete. In essence, this proof shows us that the row rank and column rank of a matrix are equal because the rows are dual to the columns, and the relationship of duality is a very natural one. At this point, you might be wondering whether it was really necessary to develop all the machinery of duality in order to prove this result. The answer to that question is no. It's possible to give a more direct proof. But was it worth it? To put a map down, flip it, and reverse it? Absolutely yes. The theory of duality is beautiful and powerful, and gives us deep insight into even this simple result about matrices. Here are the references I used in making this video. I'd like to specifically call out Werner Grube's elegant book, which had the strongest influence on me and which served as the primary inspiration for the video. Thanks for watching.